I appreciate Theophilus hanging in there with that song. That's not as bad as I did one time, Theophilus. It took me just three times to baptize a man one time. I baptized him on the third time. At this session, Brother William Woodson, who is head of the Bible department at Freed Hardeman College in Henderson, Tennessee, will be preaching to us on the previously noted and announced theme. And Brother Woodson was here with us last year, and I believe the year before, been here several times with us, and it's always a delight and a joy to have him. He wouldn't be where he is if he didn't love the Word and know the Word and was not capable of remarkably so communicating it to others. And so because of his studious habits and because of his soundness in the faith and because of his love for the Lord and because we knew he could make a distinct contribution to our program, we wanted him this year. We're delighted the time has come to listen to him speak, Brother William Watson. Uh, the old story in the Second World War, a slip of the lip, may sink a ship. It well could misintroduce a speaker, too. All right, enough said. Those of us who are perfect must learn to tolerate those of you who are less. <laughs> That's the biblical motto, you know, the strong bearing with the weak. Glad to be here. I'm thrilled to be in your presence. A couple of words and then the discussion. If you had a chance to look through this book, I didn't edit it. I edit another book, but if you've looked through it, you've seen some real competence. And that competence impresses me with the ability that is developing in various writers in our brotherhood. There are men in their 30s and 40s and 50s who will become influential men, Lord willing, in the 10 to 20 to maybe 30 years that they will be privileged to serve. And that's a blessing. In the last five or ten years, we have lost a number of great men. They've gone to their reward, Brother Gus Nichols being one of the great men, Brother B.C. Goodpasture, Brother Foy E. Wallace, a number of other fine and wonderful men. You probably have a list. That I have others to nominate. But the cause is not dead. The cause did not die when we went to the funerals or listened as those good men uh, were extolled. It didn't die there. What they believed in, what they loved, and what they struggled and sacrificed to produce, it still lives in men's hearts. And they're good men that are arising now, coming into, if you please, their maturity. And they'll pick up the banner, and they'll go on with it. In a few years, some of us will be gone. But I'm glad that I've had the privilege in the last 22 years, and Lord willing, we'll continue to do that, to train some other young men 18, 19, 20 years of age. They're coming on. And there's some little boys that are coming on. Their mamas and daddies are teaching them, and they'll come on. They'll make great elders and great fathers, great deacons, great preachers, and great servants. In the midst, then, of problems and difficulties that we experience, and we could all name many of them. Let's not lose sight of the fact that they're good men and good women, and they're serving. And where we have competence, and we have dedication, we have balance and hard work. We may not know the way, but we'll find the way, and we'll make the way. 
We have to serve in our generation as those that have laid down their tasks serve in theirs. I therefore do not despair for the future of the church. I don't believe that the church of our Lord is on the brink of apostasy. I don't believe that. I don't believe that every knee is bowed to the devil and his crowd. And I don't believe that we ought to harbor suspicion of each other and create undue tension and turmoil by an ugly spirit and a disagreeable, unpleasant way of disagree. Disagree, yes. If you disagree with me, you're wrong. I believe I'm right in everything I believe. If I didn't, I'd change it. Now, aren't you of that same persuasion? Do you know of a single thing that you'd stand before this group and say, I'm wrong about? No. I may be wrong, but I don't think I am. And when I see that I am wrong, I need to change. But you're just as honest. and You have the same right to be wrong as I do. And so when we disagree, and we're going to on some things, let's discuss our problems, consider them in the light of clear, simple Bible truth. And having found that, let us not yield a split hair on Bible truth, but lay aside every personal opinion and preference that would hinder the unity and the harmony of the body of Jesus Christ, whether the east or the west, this side of the Mississippi or that, whether you go to this school or that school, whether you write for this paper or that, whether you do this or that or the other, we are a great brotherhood of thousands of people with great strength and great love for the Bible and the love for the Lord, and we're not about to turn the church over or even our nation over to wickedness and immorality. We're going to fight. And we're going to win. Because God is on our side. Or rather, we're on God's side. And that makes a difference. Now to the lesson. Difficult text. There may be disagreement on the details here of how to interpret these verses, I understand that. When we face difficult passages of the Bible, we need to have a reverence for the text. I believe that the original documents were inspired down to the letters, down to the little curls that are the part of the Yod and the Dalit and the Iota and all of the other letters. I believe that. And I think we ought to contend for the full orb truth set forth therein. Reverence for the text and honesty of heart. Boy, that's so important, isn't it? Above and beyond the fire of discussion, there ought to be an honesty of heart that says in the midst of the discussion, now, I see that. I've been wrong all my life about it. But I see that. That's the truth. And I'll go into the judgment believing that. I've changed now. doesn't matter if I didn't believe it yesterday. I believe it now. It's the truth. That's honesty of heart. Again, thoroughness of study. Thoroughness. It takes more in difficult passages than what we can come up with up, come up with over a couple of cups of coffee or two quick phone calls or a look in one commentary. You see, there are some truths that we have not discovered yet that God has known all along. Now you let that sink in just a little bit. 
We did not know the full truth about Bible examples and anteism until we had to debate that issue. The Bible taught it to begin with. We didn't make that up. We just discovered what God had revealed in the midst of the problem in which we found ourselves. Gus Nichols told me, I believed it then, but I believe it now even more. The answer to every religious problem is in the Bible. And sometimes the hard passages yield the greatest results because they force us to lay aside our preconceived ideas and struggle into the wee hours of the morning, often on our knees, often with fear in our hearts that we're wrong, but struggle until the truth of it shines crystal clear and we'd die before we'd give it up. Now, till we get to that sense of thoroughness, that sense of honesty, that sense of regard for the truth. We're not worthy to join in the ranks of the great heroes of faith in the Old and the New Testament, nor with that worthy line of men and women who have served in the history of our brotherhood. We need to think along that line, and the difficult passages force us to. We're talking about then some verses in Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In Leviticus chapter 11 and verse 19, there's the passage which has to do with the question of the bat. Now, on the surface, this seemed like a simple question. Some ways it is, some ways it's not. In this chapter earlier, there is a discussion of the clean and unclean animals what can and what cannot be eaten. In verse 13, there is the heading or topical sentence of the paragraph, and these ye shall have an abomination among the birds. Birds. They, he says, shall not be eaten. Then he lists a number of these, and finally, at the end of the paragraph, as the American Standard Version has in verse 19, and the stork, the heron after its kind, and the hoopoe, and the bat. Now in one verse we have birds, and the next we have bat. Now the question arises, is the bat a bird? If it's not, why is it listed among the birds? If Moses, the writer, knew the truth about the matter, why did he call the bat a bird? Is there a difference? Well, in answer to that, in modern taxonomy, yes. In modern taxonomy, the bat is regarded as a mammal and not as a bird. In the scientific classification, the bat is in the order this has to do with the kingdom phylum and all of that. It is in the order Chiroptera. There are about 400 species of bats in the world. Some 21 of them are known in Israel. Now this brings us to the modern classification also of the bird. Is the bird in the order Chiroptera? No. It is in the class called Aves. So Aves and Coropta are different. When you use the binomial nomenclature of modern taxonomy. Well, what about that? I found an error in the Bible then. One verse says it's bird, the other says bat. Bat's not bird, therefore Bible's wrong. Now, we can take hold of that two or three ways. One way to take hold of it is to notice when the modern system of, of classification began. It dates from a Swedish scientist named Linnaeus, who died in 1778. In 1758, and that was before the Revolutionary War, 
This man published a book on the systems of nature. And since that time, with additions here and there and modifications and so on, there has been a classification system of general acceptance among the scientists of the world. Now, by this refined system, called the binomial nomenclature, technically, the bat and the bird are two different kinds of creatures. Now, the question arises in the classification here, what is the explanation? Well, you cannot argue with the fact, if you look at the bat and its structure and so on, that there are some things about it that are different from birds. It's a mammal by the classification, has a characteristic. You may want to get into the study someday of taxonomy, which is the most interesting matter. It has a great deal to do with evolutionary thought because of the word kind in the book of Genesis. What are the limits of kind? What is it that the word means and so on? Well, we're into that same area here. It's interesting in my judgment to look not at the word bat, but at the word bird. What does the word mean here? Well, there are two Hebrew words translated bird. And the question to be decided is this term as precise as is the modern-day term aves. You see, when there are forces that cannot move, you have a contradiction. And I'm raising the question, is the Hebrew word as precise as the modern taxonomy would make it? The answer is no. For example, one word that is translated bird in Leviticus 11.13 is the Hebrew word oph or off, O-P-H. If you look in the back of Young's Analytical, for example, it's translated bird, fowl, flying, or that flies. That's pretty general. By that definition, anything that flies could be called a bird anything. Anything that flies would satisfy the general meaning of that word oaf. In a sense, an airplane would be an oaf, wouldn't it? It flies. Now, the point I want you to see then is what does the Hebrew word mean? It means that which flies, flies. Foul bird. There is then a range or a series of possible meanings within the scope and framework of the meaning of that term. Then in the book of Deuteronomy 14 and verse 11, Sipor means a bird, a fowl, or a sparrow. Parallel list, two words. The Hebrew then is general. It is not as precise as modern taxonomy would have it. There's a quotation in the book. But let me summarize the general word for bird and the word for bat. By etymology, the word translated bat means to fly and to fly in the dark or at night. So the Hebrew is talking about a thing that flies at night. And the list in Leviticus 11 is talking about a thing that flies. And so by practical, not by modern taxonomical classification, the bat is a thing that flies and flies in the night. And then I submit, as in the case of the quote that I've cited, is the explanation of the passage. The bat is a mammal, but as a flying mammal that flies at night, it fits under the Hebrew term oaf. No problem there of contradiction. The second one, what about the quail? A lot of men have asked that long about late September, October. A great deal like Republicans over in Perry County. Tennessee. 
All summer long, you can hear them whistling. Come November, you couldn't find one in 40 miles. <laughs> Never heard of a bird or a quail in November. That speck of the country. What about those quails? Well, notice the passage. In the book of Numbers, chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 31. There went forth a wind from Jehovah and brought quails from the sea and let them fall by the camp about a day's journey on the side and a day's journey on the other side round about the camp and about two cubits above the face of the earth. What in the world is he talking about here? Well, he's talking about a situation that had to do with Israel murmuring again. They're pretty good murmurers. You think those Jews down on Mount Sinai are murmuring nowadays? They have not begun to deal with bacon. They are going to murmur and murmur and murmur. That's been their history. They claim they're biblically entitled to that section. They'll also claim their birthright to murmur, and bacon can't do anything about it. I'll make you another promise. The day the Arabs get Jerusalem back in their control, they won't, there won't be any Jews in Jerusalem. They'll all be dead. And there's going to be one more bloody fight before they're all dead. But now they're murmuring. Always have been. In this case, they did. They said, we don't like what we've been feeding, been fed. Sound like folks in college. I was reading the other night about Harvard University in 1759. They had a riot over the kind of food served in a cafeteria. All of you dietitians take notice. They were complaining. No variety. Same old stuff every day. We cook it one way, tastes the same, like fresh oil. Cook it another way, fresh oil. I'm so sick of fresh oil. I've got to have something I can get my teeth into. I want some meat. Sound like a bear right after the end of the winter season. God said, I'm sick of this. Now that's a paraphrase. Verse 10, the anger of God. The anger of Jehovah was kindled, but he didn't stop there. Kindled greatly. You better get scared when God gets angry. You better get real scared when he gets angry greatly. He said, you want some flesh to eat? I'll give you some flesh to eat. Well, I'll put a little side dressing on. It'll come with some anger. You have to learn some days to deal with complainers kind of like God did. Help them if we can. He helped them. He sent some quails down among them, verse 18. And these quails came, and they came in a large supply. And that would have been a gun hunter's paradise, wouldn't it? A friend of mine goes down to Mexico. They really shoot those quails. Now, he didn't even begin to think about the quail they have in that section over there. The question is, what is the breadth and the extent of the flock of quails? What is meant by the two cubits above the ground in the text that we're reading? In the book, I have cited the quotation from the Jewish encyclopedia that I think really gives the general information here. Let me simply read this in order to get the point before us. According to Josephus, flocks of quails from the Arabian Gulf came flying over this stretch of sea and alike wearied by their flight and with all accustomed more than other birds to skim the ground settled in the Hebrews' camp from the antiquities of the Jews. This description is factual. The phenomena repeats itself in spring and in fall when large flocks of quails pass over the Mediterranean Sea on their migration from northern countries to Africa in fall and on their return in spring. Weary from their lengthy flight, the flocks settle on the southern coast of the country between Gaza and El Arish, 
to be caught in nets set spread out before they settle, into which they fall exhausted. The local population eats them, selling most of them in city markets. Until the 1930s and 40s, millions of quails were caught in this way at these seasons, but their number has since decreased. And so the idea is that the birds come flying in, oh, three, four, maybe five feet off the ground, weary, and they simply put up nets or take various uh, utensils or whatever and just knock them down, capture them. That seems to have been what the Jews are said to have done, according to this explanation. Now, as is always the case, there are some other folks that have some other ideas. In Kyle Dalich's work, the question turns on the meaning of the word that is translated to let fall. The Hebrew is natash. According to Kyle Dalish, it means to throw over or upon the camp. That is to cover. To throw over as one would throw a blanket over something. Not the idea of coming in as we would think of birds coming in for a landing, if you please but it's something that's thrown over or draped over. And their idea is that here and there at different spots around the camp, a day's journey on this side, a day's journey on that, the bird simply fell exhausted to the ground, and all the Jews had to do was go out and take as many of them as they wished. I heard about a fellow that went squirrel hunting one day over in East Tennessee, where the squirrels were rather prolific. There were plenty of them in the tree, so he took a rock and threw it up in there. said, I left them knee-deep and still falling. Well, they had them there two cubits or so deep, according to this explanation. Well, I, for one, would not boggle to believe that if that was the truth about the matter. That wouldn't cause any problem to me. If God could create the heavens and the earth, don't you think he could put that many quails on either side of the camp of the Jews? If he could raise Jesus from the dead, do you think uh, six feet of quails would give him any trouble? Why, it'd be like an elephant pushing a peanut. That'd be no problem to God. But the question is, does the text demand that? I don't believe it does. When you look into the various lexicons, the word that is translated let fall is accurately translated in the passages. I've tried to cite the references here. And so we're really talking about the translation, the proper translation of a single word. The hardest part many times is to find out what the problem is. Heard about the blind man, didn't you? Crossing the street with a seeing-eyed dog. About halfway out, cars were bumping into each other, causing all manner of difficulty because the dog had taken him out. Instead of on the light that said to wait, on the light that had the traffic going against him. Well, it was a real problem. Finally, he got across. He had just had all sorts of problems. Got across on the other side, reached in his pocket, held out some crackers before the dog. Man saw that. He said, that's the beast thing I ever saw. Dog nearly got you killed, and here you are rewarding it. He said, I'm not rewarding it. I'm trying to find out which end its head's on so it can kick its brains out. A lot of times, solving problems in Bible study starts with figuring out where the problem is. Now, the problem here is the meaning of the word that is translated, let fall, or cause to fly, or whatever. I submit to you that the stronger case is, as we've suggested previously in the quotation from Josephus, that the quails were caused to fly in or to fall in or come in about 
oh, three or four feet above the ground, and the Jews could easily kill them or capture them. Now, the other may be the case, but I lean toward the view very strongly as a sketch. Now, next, in chapter 12 of the same book in verse 1, had a lot of trouble about married folk back then, didn't they? And they were criticizing. A lot of folks criticized other folks' wives. That hadn't died, had it? Especially when they get mad at them. You remember the story of old brother J.D. Tant at Skinner before daylight. They weren't happy with him. There's a lot that might be said about this text. They were mad at him about something else. Most of the time, when you're mad at somebody about one thing, you'll take out your madness on something else. And furthermore, look out, I'm getting off the subject now. And furthermore, she's a Cushite. And nice folks don't marry Cushites. Since you married a Cushite, you're not nice people. Now, they didn't think that up for the first time. But they used it. A lot of folks argue that way today. The question then is, was this Cushite woman Zipporah or some other woman? Well, Zipporah is an interesting woman. Ever thought about what it must have been like for Moses to have loved this woman? Zipporah. Moses and she had two sons. There's not much told about her, but no doubt she was able to bring him consolation and a measure of happiness in his exile. Kind of an unsung heroine of the Old Testament. Study her life from that standpoint one day. She was involved at the time of circumcision, and she came to meet him when he came back from Egypt. Don't you know they had a lot to talk about? Where you been, Moses? Been down to Egypt. What's going to happen? Why, well, there's a thousand, thousand, thousand of God's people coming with me. Don't you know she was proud of her man? Why, she ran over to the camp next door and started bragging about my husband. Men, let's be thankful that our wives have got something to brag about. Very little most of them have, yes. But they use it, man. I tell you, they use it. They take that one string on that fiddle and they play as much as they can. Thank the Lord for that one string. Was this woman Zipporah? Well, I don't think she was. A couple of reasons. One, Zipporah was from Midian and not from Cush or Ethiopia. Hard to get those two together. Again, the statement about this Cushite woman was a statement of fact. And that's important to remember. Yes, they spoke in ridicule and contempt, but they spoke the truth, nevertheless. I maintain then that this was likely another woman. The poor may well have been dead. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 14, there's another passage that's interesting. I think this is a classic example of violating a context. In 1426, For thou shalt bestow the money for whatsoever thy soul desireth, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul asketh of thee. That sounds like a pretty broad license, doesn't it? That's good enough for any liberty. You buy anything you want that you've got money enough to pay for. Well, that's a license to do anything. The mafia doesn't have any better license than that. Now, does that authorize moderate drinking? No more than it authorizes moderate cutting. Whatsoever thy soul desireth, Anything you want, if you've got money enough to buy it. No, no, I'm not talking about that. Well, that's what it says here, though. Well, yeah, but... And when a fellow starts, yeah, buddy, you know you've got it. 
That's the first sign that he's giving up. Now watch out, he's going to get ugly with you next. Now the context of this has to do with the time when Israel would come into the land. When he got in there, the problem would arise about where they lived and where they were supposed to worship God. You couldn't worship God just anywhere in the great feast days of the Jews. You had to go up to where the name of God was. If you try to drive an animal from up in Dan or Beersheba down to Jerusalem, you'd lose every bit of religion you had. So the thing the Lord said to do, if you read the context, is turn it into money and then go down there and buy what you need and use it in the worship of God. And the rest of the verse confirms that. He says, And thou shalt eat there before Jehovah thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thy household. This is not talking for a moment about moderate drinking today. And moderate drinking quickly turns into immoderate drinking and immoderate behavior. I've been around whiskey and things of that sort many times in my life. And I've never seen anything good come out of it except for the bootleggers and the whiskey sellers. Broken hearts, broken homes, broken dreams, broken lives. Don't talk to me about drinking. But another matter. Deuteronomy 24. What about this uncleanness? And I'll have to hurry. You thought I was going to spend the whole time on it. I didn't go to college most of my life without learning something. I know when to watch a clock. What is this unclean thing? You'll see another matter discussed there in the book that is pertinent. Very, very significant matter. I submit to you this unseemly thing is a very interesting matter. The Hebrew is not as clear as we would want it to be. I do not see it proved as yet that the Hebrew word means adultery. In the preceding book, or rather in the preceding chapter, if you'll notice in verse 14, Deuteronomy 23 and 14, the same Hebrew word is found having to do with the process of elimination. And the same word that he may not see an unclean thing in thee and turn away from thee. Now that's the same word. And that's important to remember. What does it mean? Well, it's been much debated. I do not believe that it meant adultery. In the first place, death was a penalty for adultery. Again, the unclean or unseemly thing is not found in the list of sexual faults as cited in the passages. But the word does have to do with something that is shameful, that is evil. It referred to the indecent exposure of the body. I've cited the verses there. It also alluded to sexual practices that were supposed to be shunned. And the fact that the word abomination is used to refer to this particular misconduct suggests that it's something more than burning biscuits. It was some kind then of degrading, unclean, disgusting, repulsive activity that had to do with sexual activity, but was not necessarily adultery. This verse then is cautioning against any quick, hasty divorces, any idea that a man can divorce and remarry any time he pleases. In fact, if you look at the text carefully, he's not approving divorce and easy marriage at all, the very thing the Jews misunderstood in Matthew 19. That's another subject in and of itself. But the verse in Deuteronomy 24 is saying, now look, there are some things you can't do. And you're mistreating the woman and you're mistreating yourself and you're mistreating God and creating an abomination when you take the marriage vows and marriage contact, uh, contract lightly. And the Jews extrapolated from that and tried to make it into 
the ground of divorce for every cause that was unauthorized in Deuteronomy 24.1. And Jesus had to correct them, and I say again, that Matthew 19, 1 to 9 is a unit, and it is not three legislation. But that's another day. Appreciate being here. Thank you, Brother Winkler. We look forward to you and others being with us at Henderson for our lectureship there. Thank you.